Hey guys, welcome back to a Seller Sessions, another special in-depth. I bring back Ijeo. How are you doing, Ijeo? Good, good. Thanks for having me. Excellent. I won't even try to say your full name. Do you want to say the full name to the audience? Egla. I always get this is Egla. Egla. Yeah, Egla. I'm, I'm used to being Eagle. This is like my middle name, so you can yeah. call me Eagle. If so you I should to. go back to calling you Egla because I trade it in for Ijeo and, you know. Yes, um, you tried everything for me. Yeah, and I try all these different names, but maybe starting, you know, the good thing would be is to actually use your name given at <laughs> birth as well. Um, do you want to uh, quickly explain? I'm just going to share to the groups, but do you want to explain to the audience what you've been up to in the last couple of weeks? And then we'll get into your story. Oh, yeah. Uh, if you guys know the game where you hold an egg in your, your little spoon and you try to run as fast as you can, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I kind of feel this way because we are now, since we are a multiple seven-figure company in Amazon, we're trying to exit in the next uh, 10 months, 12 months. And, you know, in this situation, you really have to pay attention to your costs. You don't, you can't really have major hiccups anymore because the uh, potential buyer wants to see a steady revenue and uh, profitability growth. So mm -hmm. everything we do is in a magnifying glass so i kind of feel like having an egg on a little spoon and running as fast as i can to have this you know hockey stick graph uh in yep. a drawn up the right way yes that makes sense cool right i've shared to the groups let's take it way way back well not that long ago uh let's take <laughs> it back to your childhood so tell me some of the earliest memories in terms of entrepreneurship did you, was you an early bloomer did you have influential people in your life that played a role to make you are today in terms of, of an entrepreneur? I think my story is not really that traditional, you know, I didn't really own any soda stands and I didn't sell newspapers and I didn't, uh, I don't know, publish any newspapers and, it, you know, all those things that kids do, they organize some kind of business-like things. I didn't do that. I was... Yeah. A kind of like really happy kid, but I grew up in a little Puller Bee village, you know, there were less than 100 people over there. And, you know, most of those I knew and there was really nothing going on. But my dad was super entrepreneurial. And even if there was like less than 100 people, uh, you know, he did basically everything he could. He managed the sewage system. He was building uh buildings for people he was managing the electricity system he had like a tractor he had a school bus so basically i think a reason why i didn't get to exercise my entrepreneurial cheat from my daddy mm -hmm. is that he made me work so hard like i was sewing gloves to him to his works uh workman um i was collecting the potato beetles from the ground uh and we got paid by the kilo so you kind of need to have like thousands of these little uh, guys in your HR. And uh, when, now when I think back, I kind of think that I had this gene very early on because, you know, when other girls were sticking like butterflies and Barbie dolls on their um, little notebooks with locks on, I actually got out pictures with people doing business and shaking hands. And I was kind of, I had this little secret notebook where in one side I had pictures about horses because I desperately wanted to own a horse. And if you flip it over, you can just see pictures of people doing business that I have no idea why I did that, but I kind of felt nice. It felt something that, you know, something is going on in the world um, mm -hmm. outside my little village. So I guess I compensated the stillness and peacefulness of living by uh, fantasizing this way. Yeah, that makes sense. So talk to me about early childhood in terms of school like i've never been a fan of school as people know i'll probably bleat on about it too much what's your take on it educate traditional education school what did you excel at school was it something that you were interested in well, um, I kind of have two phases of school, you know, when I went to this little school that had also fewer than 100 kids, you know, it was like a home. You go there, you know everybody, and you're, I was the happiest kid over there. But that was almost coming out from the Soviet era. So people were, you have to know a little bit about the history, you know, Soviet in Soviet times, everybody who was a little bit outspoken or entrepreneurial, they got uh, sent away to Siberia. So basically our nation, I come from Estonia, uh, got cleaned up from all the people who there to speak up so i was going to school at this time where like mommies and daddies were being kind of shy and quiet and we as school kids we just tried to fit in so i think yeah. that's my early influence of just trying to be invisible in a way and it mm. i don't know if it's my character trait or this is just a soviet era um yeah. gift i have gift so called so 
yeah, but for the sixth grade, I uh, had to go to a bigger school to study English. Um, and then um, my like happy school time really didn't last any longer because at this time uh, in the 90s, um, you know, the support system for the pupils, it wasn't really over there. So something really silly happened that I don't really feel comfortable talking about because it was so silly. Hmm. But it made me feel like a blackout for uh, you know, starting from seventh to twelfth grade, and even all the way to the university time. So, I kind of had to. I guess that's my second, really, like a stand-up place where I had to take care of myself. I had to organize help for myself uh, because there was no support system whatsoever to get me out of this hole that I tag myself, mm. pretty much myself, and just in the sake of uh, shining a light on what happened and why it's so silly is that. You know, um, nowadays kids don't sit, uh, necessarily sit together, but uh, uh, when I went to school, we were sitting together. And when I went to the seventh grade, my friends suddenly decided that she doesn't want to sit with me anymore. And I was thinking, what's wrong with me? Why doesn't yeah. she want to sit with me? And over there, I just started to figure out all the things that why I'm faulty, why I'm wrong. Mm. And I couldn't understand what's going on. I could understand something is wrong. I, I'm not supposed to feel this way. <clears throat> but uh, I didn't know. <laughs> Nobody could help me. So, okay. So how I sold this to myself? Yes, my self-esteem went down, um, but my entrepreneurial spirit got up. So... My mom was a doctor, but she's a family doctor. She doesn't really know much about, you know, psychology. So I told my mom that, you know what, put me to a car, drive me to a psychologist. <laughs> and that was super embarrassing because I have to remind you guys, we're coming from the Soviet era. People don't talk about feelings. They hardly even hugged at this time when I was a kid. So that was like a super crazy step that I did that I told my mom that, please bring me to a psychologist. I kind of need some help. <laughs> And addition to, additional to that, I started to socialize, of course, with some other girls who didn't feel so good about themselves. And at this time, some sort of, um, you know, self-educational courses. Hey, Joel, keep, pop I'm just, just going to quickly shut the door because the farmer is plowing the field and all yes. the shit coming in. Stay, carry on going. Stay. Oh, my God. <laughs> Now, this is definitely a first time that that had happened in Danish show. <laughs> I'm sure you have some a lot of crazy stuff happening. Sorry about that. That's the part. When you live in a village and you've got the farmer, he's, he's harvesting and literally he's like a well coming towards me, like a swell. And this room, would you, I've got some now, but it would literally fill this room up with wheat or whatever it is that he's harvesting over there. So very important. Yeah. Let's carry on back on this point. So. From yeah, my well, understanding, well, the levels of emotion and the uh, the integration of that kind of relationship wasn't standard. Like people didn't show their feelings back then. You were a very young girl. You had a situation where the um, you couldn't understand how to communicate this with people in the school because when someone stepped back and no one's showing their feelings, you didn't know how to react to that. So you went and spoke to, to someone professionally to a, get a better understanding of what was going on. Is that right? Yeah, that's true. But uh, something that, uh, you know, I was at the middle of is that I kind of know when I look back, I understand that this maybe this is entrepreneurial spirit a little bit too, even if you don't mm -hmm. feel so good about yourself, is that I started to communicate with other kids that didn't really feel so good about themselves or the situation or the school or whatever. So I started to gather those kids up and uh, we kind of uh, sought out the first ever courses for kids, how to feel better about whatever stresses they have in their lives. And we started to go there. And uh, that's what we did. Yeah. But otherwise, that was a pretty crazy situation because I think nobody really likes to feel bad. Nobody wants to feel depressed. But I don't feel bad about it, really, because I think something that it teaches you is the depth uh, and also the empathy and uh, willingness to understand how, why people feel the way they would do. And, um, also that, uh, you know, something I talked about uh, in Branded by Women is you need contrast in your life to be able to make decisions that are going to bring you faster to the place you want to be. You need polarity. And yeah. I think that was kind of like a starting point for me to develop 
this kind of polarity that I know what I want from my life. I want to achieve stuff and I want to be happy. So yeah. I know those things really clearly. And no, I am not the master of that. You know, I yeah. think this is a lifelong journey for everybody. Yeah. So this was what age would you say? Put uh, uh, an, If you don't want to put an age on it, I know you're talking about different uh, I think this is like a teenage, uh, you know, just pre pre university from seventh to twelfth grade, which is yeah, this is a teenage. So I yeah. I was not an early bloomer, you know. When you don't feel good about yourself, you don't party, you yeah. don't really do anything, more, you know. You just kind of like live in your bubble and you try, just try to survive. That's that's what you do. Yeah, yeah. But obviously, <laughs> that that was the start of something because a lot of people don't really develop those social skills or understanding of those skills to the a bit older, maybe late teens, etc. But you were quite young when you were, ex you know, not experimenting, but you were understanding what, what was going on. And, and you mentioned earlier on, did you say that you and other people kind of done a course to help other kids to understand, to express okay. themselves? We, yeah, we try to help ourselves. And I think, you know, I, I read at this time, there were coming out the first ever psychology books in Estonian as well, because in Russian time, there was no such a thing, you know, mm. and I just kind of bought them all. I didn't have much pocket money, but I didn't buy candy. I just bought psychology books and I just read them secretly because nobody in, in, in my family, you know, even talked about it. So that was kind of like under the pillow secret I had. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so okay, I so remember, yeah, I remember to be like the diplomat of the family after that because I developed like a whole set of skills from those books. <laughs> well, they say the formative years of when, when you're very young, you know, it's like some, when you're born up to about seven, I think there are key things that are your formative skills and through your life you've got subconsciously how you walk around. You know, it's like your relationship with people, your relationship with money and stuff. And a lot of that early learning in first seven years are very, very important. And maybe because of the the culture and everything around you and stuff, not that wasn't a common theme. And it's like you picked up the baton later on in life to fill in some of those gaps. Would you say Definitely. That? Absolutely. Yeah. Because because, you know, when you live in a small village and your parents are just coming out of the Soviet era where nobody was really allowed to own anything that yeah. significant, you kind of want to get this anxiety away from your life. So I think if I'm just jumping to this day to day, this is a reason me and my partner, we want to do an exit. Otherwise, we could just go on and on with this Amazon brand. But you want to do an exit just to get some of the anxiety settled down. Mm -hmm. And whatever you do in the future, you at least know that you're not going to end up, you know, under any like pine tree to sleep, uh, because you have taken care of your loans and your commitments that, you know, yeah. having a family and stuff, it just brings to your life. Okay, so you left school. What was the, the first jobs out of school you were doing? Well, um, I went to the university and the, the weird thing is that, uh, you know, I, I uh, hit jump to the gene technology and then I kind of found myself being like a, I don't know, out of place because I went to these higher math classes and I felt like, oh my God, this is like Chinese to me and why don't I understand anything? I've been, you know, going to school for 12 years and i don't understand this thing and i don't want to be stuck in the lab wearing white coat all day and you know not being outside and doing nothing so i kind of felt like i need to escape so i went to minnesota the united states to be an au pair for a year just mm. to have a breather you know yeah. learning i think that's what every young person should do when they finish the high school they just kind of need to figure out what do they want yeah. and I just I, I got I got my feet on the ground a little bit more. And when I came back, I knew I cannot continue with this gene technology. They're just gonna kill me. Mm. So I had no idea what to do. So I just applied, you know, I was already enrolled to the university. So I just went into the journalism department. And uh, you know, they, they enrolled really, really bright kids over there, kids who are passionate about politics and they want to investigate stuff. And you know, they are like reading police PR messages every morning for fun and they know so much what's going on, you know, they know all the countries by heart and Definitely not me. So, but I didn't know what to do. So I managed to convince somehow uh, this department that I know something about what's going on in life. The reality was that I wanted them to teach me what's going on in life. Yeah. <laughs> so I entered to the bachelor. I ended up um, 
having a master's degree in the communication, mm. uh, which is great because I think that's what I needed. I just needed to get integrated back to life again after having a harsh um, school time. Yeah. But the way I um, uh, was different from a regular university kid was that I, again, didn't really have that much money. And I was also really, really shy uh, with not too high confidence, but I needed money. And I was studying journalism. So don't ask me. I don't know how I ended up, but I ended up working in the morning radio station, waking up people. Like yeah. my body was covered in cold sweat every single morning, five o'clock when I started and nine o'clock when I finished, I just ran to my class and I financed my you know studies this way like over a year and so thinking you, you back got, to that land, I, I don't you know you landed the job I, in yes you landed the breakfast show effectively yes in yes. radio as the motivator who was someone who was shy and yes don't you ask were paid, me how was that possible? you were paid to do know. that so were you paid as that was that a because uh, most of the time because I've done radio I was on kiss uh fm for a few years oh wow and the thing is, is that a lot of people struggle to get into radio and they do it for free for many, many years until they get their proper break. And normally the breakfast show is where the money pays like that and drive time on most commercial radio stations. I never done daytime. I've done. But my point is, did you um, you took that on? So you pushed your boundaries there to go and do it. But oh, you use that to pay for your education. So you got paid yeah. as a job. I got great. paid. I don't know how this is even possible. I got paid and being a shy person, you know, I had to be funny on air and I I wish I filmed myself. I wish I knew what I was talking about. They didn't yeah. fire me clearly. So something I there was something I did, right? But yeah. I think what takeaway from here is that I did push my boundaries so much that I was so scared. Yeah. And pushing boundaries as an entrepreneur is something that is basically a daily thing to do. You have to push your boundaries. You don't know. Like living in uncertainty is your everyday certainty. Yeah. And this yeah. is just an early experience from that. So you left uni, you left the radio career behind you where we, yeah. where did we go next uh then we go to the capital of estonia i was in a in a university uh, city before but i went to capital of estonia and i really felt like th i need to be somebody i need to like show what's under the skin you know i've been shy all my life like i can do corporate so let me go into corporate yeah. i entered corporate uh one of the biggest newspapers in Estonia I and you know by secretly I can say that I hate writing I don't really write mm -hmm. but uh, I landed the position of uh, managing a medical newspaper in the business daily which is really crazy because I have no medical education my staff that I had to hire had no medical education mm -hmm. <laughs> and you have those people studying medicine for 20 years and um, obviously my ambition was to prove myself. And the funny thing is that um, the takeaway from my corporate era is that I was trying to please somebody who is unpleasable. You know, the mm. corporate machine is unpleasable. You just yeah. give yourself, you give yourself, you give yourself. But if you don't know how to set boundaries, you just end up losing yourself in this machine. But it doesn't matter. What I took from there as strength is that there was nobody in my staff that really could handle taking the phone when like an angry doctor called and it wasn't because of us, but because we were a voice for some other doctors who wanted to voice how the new treatment is going or some new ideas. And they were angry. How can you publish this? This is, you know, they're not supposed, they're from the small hospital. They don't know what they're talking about. So I, I thought, that, okay, this is a wonderful opportunity for me to learn how to deal with stress. So mm -hmm. I was sitting with these men who are usually like over 55. They're really opinionated. They're really egoistic. And I was just sitting basically half a day with them on the phone. I was listening to them when what I learned is that you have to mirror. I understand you're really frustrated. This must feel so terrible. You're calling, writing this, and you don't agree with that. And, you know, I was just l using all this knowledge that as a child I've been learned from Diplomacy. the Diplomacy. So you're being, a, you're being diplomatic when you're dealing with them and, and yes. listening and, and understanding their point of view. Yes, and that was like so, something that nobody really wanted to do. And I took this as advantage of why I want to talk about it is that one of the biggest models of my life is that any problem is actually a 
opportunity in disguise. Yeah. And this is huge. This mm. is huge because after proving myself as that I can handle extreme pressure from these doctors, you know, of course, the subscription amounts rose. We we were extremely profitable newspaper, we were like one of the most profitable uh, departments in this uh, place. I got offered next and the next and the next managerial positions, and I was really happy about it. But what I learned is that I couldn't hold any more managerial positions, more no more than 12 months, yeah. because I just got bored. <laughs> so yeah. I kind of started to feel that something is up. And also something is up when you keep burning out and mm -hmm. you keep hiding yourself from your uh, you know, supervisors and bosses, even when you're in the hospital, come on. I was like taking phone and yeah, yeah, I can't come in today because I'm having home office. And actually I was just in a hospital because my body just stopped functioning. Mm -hmm. I was so crazy, really, really crazy. And, you know, by this time I already had met my, um, husband at this time. And he's been such an amazing person, you know, me not being a traditional woman, uh, going crazy in career and, uh, from this point and understanding that corporate is not for me. Uh, we started numerous, numerous businesses from this We're point gonna on. We're going to get to those, yeah. So yes. let's, before we get there, let's just say some hellos here in the feed. Matt Parker says, hi, Danny. Uh, we spoke in Prague, girl, regarding health, and I remember your amazing vibe. Really happy to see you live and well. Ivan is says, hi, Hey, Joe and Danny, good to see you guys. Matt here says, ha, 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 shutting the door on the shit. I know the feeling. So we're talking about the combine harvester outside. It's getting warm in here. Um, okay, what else have we got here? I really need to read up more on psychology at the moment in reference to life and business. Do you have any recommendations on some decent literature? We've got Tiff is uh, these are great tips for dealing with difficult people. Tiff, there's a lot of difficult people out there. Again, that's an oh, opportunity. Yes. Christy, uh, it says, yes, problems are opportunities. Continuing mm -hmm. that conversation there yes, to Christy, be solved. Yes. Right. Failure. Let's go straight in. I mean, you're a menace, like five businesses. And now we're, we'll get to, we'll land the story where we are now. But let's walk through these five this fierce woman who never gave up with five <laughs> failures, starting well, with see, failure number one. We come back to the polarity. Yeah. If you know yeah. what you don't want and you, you know, you kind of understand it. I cannot handle corporate because I cannot handle more than 12 months and, and I keep burning out. So I, there has to be something else. So, okay, let there be mm -hmm. something else, but you cannot have something else when you don't have money. So yeah. while I was doing corporate, I started sidekicks with my husband. So first, company we had was a kids furniture company we did beds i designed them ivan designed them he was manufacturing those i was selling those and i remember like you know we had even like a like a little workshop set up in my dad's garage at this time and it just didn't go anywhere and i think that's great because we get to learn some persistence some marketing skills some ways how not to give up we well, made the ends meet but we didn't really go anywhere and then we just got tired of that okay so, so what was what was the failure there so obviously it wasn't a devastating failure but you got to learn along the way what would you have said looking back now what what would you have done differently on that business you know what? I don't think I would have done anything differently because any everybody who wants to go to business, they need to start from something. The mm. biggest failure is if you never start. And mm. we just did this furniture, those beds, and we put all our love in there. And then we just thought that, you know, we don't want to do it anymore because it's just like we either need to start start buying machinery or we need to do something else to be able to scale that stuff. And I yeah. was also working full time and mm. we also had our first kid at this time. So like, I did not see this. Like we don't have money to set up all the manufacturing and stuff. So uh, the next step in our venture was the vending machines. Okay. Uh, so that was more for my husband because that's more technical. Uh, he organized those machines from Italy. We got the first experience of international trade, you know, with Southern Europeans. It's definitely not something you can compare with Chinese or Americans. Mm -hmm. They don't reply for you for weeks. Your payment yeah. terms are crazy. Um, you get your machines like months later than you're supposed to, and things are just out of hand. But um, the funny thing was that 
he ended up filling, you know, the chocolates and the coffee all day. And we kind of felt like this is not scalable either because the margins are not that big. And we so, so, is the com- so uh, these these are confectionery vending machines that are supplied yeah. to offices around yeah. Estonia. Yeah. What, what was the what was the goal? What was I know they're vending machines, but what was the proposition of the business? Well, we we uh, the funny thing was that I was doing sales when my kid was sleeping in the car at the same time. So each time I went to do the sale, I timed it. I always like called and said, I'm going to come to the lunchtime. So I was driving around the block. So my kid is going to fall asleep in the car. I don't know that if that's legal or no. I think I don't think that's legal. That's but right. when we he won't fell, tell anyone. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> when he fell asleep, I went in and I knew that my kid is having like 25 minutes when he's not waking up. So I always need to be sharp and sharp and you know get the preposition but we provided the machines for free um so for the like school uh, schools and uh sporting venues just to have uh, like a snacking and a hot beverage opportunity so but you know that was pretty new at this time so i was like 20 something i was really young the kid was in the car it was actually pretty hectic but again, what to take away is that I didn't take this as a bad thing. I took this like, Egla, if you can pull this up, you know, you have a kid in the car, you're a young mom, um, but you can do it. It's something that normal people don't do. But if you go and do it, first of all, you're going to learn. Second of all, maybe you're going to land a deal. And that's that I kind of had a different attitude towards situations that any other young mom would say that you're just crazy go back to home go have a stroll with your baby and just enjoy your life you know and something that most people maybe don't know that Estonia is actually like a heaven for young moms because the state pays you uh, one and a half years full mother's maternity leave so you don't actually have to do anything you can just be home and your full salary is gonna pop in your bank account every month so it was actually a good time to do business because you know the Famine was not there <laughs> in yeah. a direct sense, but we couldn't scale it, so we dropped it. We just yeah. dropped it. So, what was, what was the difficult points of scale? What was the bit you couldn't scale? Is it because confectionery, all the all the charges of being delivered, then you'd have to load the machines and like the logistic logistics of it? Is that what caused a lot of the problem? We had to like Ivan eventually didn't want to end up being a logistics and confrontary like fill up guy to mm. to haul his life and we couldn't outsource yeah. that because the margins were so thin if we hire yeah. somebody all the margins are going to go Gone. to his salary yeah. so that just didn't make any sense we did not think about it when we started but i don't think again that this is a problem because mm. you just get another experience and something well, experience- i really yeah, you, t- you learned about margins on that experience, lack of, bit of scalability. The first one was just learning how to do business, and in the end, you got bored as well. So them two, yeah. did not yeah. So number three, talk about yeah, three. yeah. So well, the thing that the kids' furniture and the vending machines, I did next to having actually a kid or a full time job in a corporate. So. Mm. I couldn't be full in. I just always felt like I felt I left Ivan alone. We had multiple arguments about it. We didn't really know how to handle all this work. So I thought, okay, the next thing I have to do myself. And the next thing I did was having a digital marketing company. So you can see from here that all the businesses we've done, like they've been all over the place. There is no consistency whatsoever. So I just want to pass this myth that you study something and you're consistent and you stay with like your whatever is given to you for the whole life no you can just go out and go crazy as long as you're willing to learn just go crazy whatever interests you yes so um in the corporate i was heavily educating myself because we were largest um content providers in seminars conferences uh, and also book publishing uh, in estonia um my department was organizing all these conferences and schooling so i basically participated in every single one and in uh, one goal in mind i wanted to be as good in marketing as possible so the next logical st- step was to do my own digital marketing company which i did and by this time i already knew something about amazon but that was so early that was like 2000 i don't know 2000 something that if you log in it's super scary it's super crazy and you kind of get lost immediately uh but i already know that you have to have a little capital to start. So I was thinking that, okay, I can do that next to the digital marketing company. And then I can put my toes into this whenever I'm ready to do that. Uh, But 
the learning point for me uh, from here is that I completely took myself off from the corporate payroll. And that is super, 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 super scary thing to do. And it is absolutely necessary because this is not the first time I did that. A second time I did that is coming in the forward story. Yeah. Uh, but you have to take yourself away. It's... Uh, from the certainty. The only way you are going to find creative solutions in your business, how to excel and move on forward faster is when the security cord is just cut off and then your brain starts to work in completely different uh, frequency. Yeah. So yeah, I had all these clients. I had big like tourism clients. Um, I landed those myself. Again, uh, second kid was born. Kid was here. Computer was here. <laughs> I worked from home. I went to meetings in their place. I had a local TV tower, local maritime museum, some smaller companies. Is, and I started to hate it. I started to hate doing the same thing, like optimizing the Facebook ads, uh, creating content. It was just getting so similar, so similar. And it comes back to my nature that, you know, I kind of need to do new things all the time. And I want to really do a shout out to my um, husband at this time, Ivan, that he handled me changing those things like so, so rapidly. Uh, I can't change. I can't change this part of my personality. I need a lot of change, and th that's why I think Amazon is it's very good in my life because it just gives you so many opportunities to do so many things. <laughs> and we'll you usually start. The, we'll get, yeah, we'll get to the main Amazon story later. So we're on number. We're going to move between three. Where did we wrap on three? What was the um, the learning digital marketing, points? Yeah, the digital marketing company. I think yeah, it's just to, to become um, a solo entrepreneur first time, um, off the security and on my own, completely yeah. on my own. And now I go crazy again. Mm -hmm. I had a passion project. I really loved interior architecture, so I started to study interior architecture, and that was crazy because when you have kids, when you have like monetary needs, uh, you have to service digital marketing clients. Uh, studying is so intensive, like one painting class takes you four hours. This is mm -hmm. forever if you talk to any mom or any business owner, but yeah. I still wanted to do that. So I started I did, uh, the architecture company. I had some clients. I actually managed to scale up this revenue so well that I could live off it. And then I realized that, oh, my God, like money only comes in when I put hours um, mm -hmm. in. And this is not going to work out. This is not going to work out because I knew some uh, interior designers being completely burned out. Because, you know, even if you have some assistance, the yeah. final word still goes to the main designer. And this is never going to change. So I had mm -hmm. to drop it. I had to drop my passion. And mm -hmm. yeah, I was sad, but but it gave way to Amazon. And yeah. So, that's so story very... number four or business number four is Amazon. And, uh, yeah. is five, uh, business number five is Amazon. <laughs> number four then. What's number four? Uh, well, first was kids, then the vending, then the digital marketing, then the interior architecture. Oh, so sorry, we have yeah. four sorry. companies. Yeah, yeah, sorry, because that, ble that just blended in then. Right, so yeah, we're at the, the main thing. Let's talk about when you discovered Amazon. When was that? What was that thunderbolt? When was that moment when you went, I need to do this? Oh, yeah, I needed to do this because by this time I understood already that I am not fitting in, first of all, to a, a regular womanhood and second mm. of all, to a regular uh, corporate, um, I don't know, uh, workers' Co shoes. Yeah. 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 I, just, I, I just can't do that. So um, we went to Asia because by, by this time already we... I knew that we have to leave uh, our home for at least six months because uh, one of our kids has special needs and things were so going so crazy for him. And that, that is a shout out for people who have, you know, family members with special needs. I know how hard it is. I know like that can tear families apart because the stress is just so hard. And if you try to build business from this um, chaos that's going on. Um, if, you, if you are in this situation, I feel for you. I know how your life looks like. But we decided we just need to end this chaos. So we just decided we're just going to go to Asia. We just 
kind of see what's out there. Uh, one month in one country, another month in, in another country. And we met everyone living two months in Bali, uh, living close to um, an assistant from a police department from United States. Mm -hmm. And she was selling chocolate pizza. And the revenue was 3000 a month per, per one um, ASIN. So I was thinking, oh my God, like I need, I need to work a full month in my digital company or my interior architecture company just to create this revenue. And she's just making this with one chocolate pizza. Like I even hold on, I let me hold on, let me understand. So I got the pronunciation right. A chocolate pizza. Yes. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Three grand a month in the chocolate. Yeah. Yes, it was right. the chocolate was covered. Uh, the um, uh, the base was made out of uh, popcorn, and the chocolate mm. was poured all over. Okay. It. And it was super, super, super sweet. So like it wasn't a deep pan with a chocolate on. That's good to know. Mm. Yeah. No, yeah. that was okay. like a candy, a candy. So yeah. I was thinking, okay, like she is not smarter than me, but I am not smarter than her because she's doing this and I am not. So yeah. I better look into this really, really deeply. So <clears throat> while living in Asia, I dropped my interior architecture company. It just had to go and started to learn. And it ended up me, you know, doing it next to the kids uh from the travel i uh, there was no time to do that the, the, the only window to really start just another company and you know any husband can get frustrated when your wife is just running wild like that like every year is something new i completely understand and you know but do you that's the question <laughs> i want to get to like, i was going yeah. to save it a bit later right when you know when you jump from one thing to another, there's two things yeah. can happen here. Is either you get bored easily and you've got no interest and so you jump from one thing to another. But but you do that also to you find your one thing. So sometimes yeah. you have to constantly experiment with stuff and, and some people never get there. Like I know my mission in life and now you know yours. But it will come mm -hmm. to people in different times of life. So when someone says, oh, they're, that person there, they could literally be unreliable. They could be the type of person that moved from one job to another. But also mm -hmm. there are some people out there who are trying to find their thing. Mm -hmm. And if you um, find your thing, I, you never work a day in your life. Yeah, I think so. And something I, I think my legacy to whatever whoever is listening to me or following my story is that you don't have to stay to one or two professions or passions in your life you can go crazy you can jump around you can be an architecture mm. freak uh, and then go to i don't know owning a cleaning company mm. uh, and this is completely fine i just want to break the status quo and i think historically we're just coming from so many status quo quos that we together we need to break mm. uh, so this is just one thing because the feedback i got from you know the corporate and wherever even from the family is that you're crazy don't do that why can't you settle down you have ants in your pants like don't do that uh and i felt like but there's no other way I, I have to do that i have to find what really speaks to me and that only comes by experience so i would encourage people to so what, have what, year, what year was amazon you started to because we'll go back into the amazon story was it 2015 uh 17 17 so congratulations you've stuck to something for three years <laughs> yes yeah yes okay. and it's been really really wild ride really really wild ride. let's get back to chocolate pizza <laughs> yeah well she was selling chocolate pizza and i yeah. obviously felt like i talked to her and I felt like, oh my God, she's doing so many different things. She's organizing international fright. She's developing products. She's designing the packages. She, she's like talking to some kind of factories. I want to do that because this is like doing so many things that sounds completely off uh, for a regular person because it is so complicated. And at the same time, I was the kid in my um, family that always did the puzzles with 5,000 pieces. I just, I love puzzles. So that was a perfect puzzle, a perfect storm for me. I just dug in and the only time I could actually dig in next to having the family and traveling and doing all those pay jobs, you know, that was from nine to two, mm. uh, nine o'clock in the evening to two o'clock a.m. So um, you have to find the time when you want to do something, unfortunately, which I don't really recommend because if you take yourself off the balance, you have to pay the dividends later. And um, it is okay to take yourself off balance. There is no 
opportunity that you can focus to more than three things in the same time. For me, it was Amazon, family, and whatever the third one was, maybe. I don't even remember, but that was Amazon and family. So I had to teach my workouts. I had to teach my friends. I had to teach going out and having fun. I didn't have any money because, you know, I was saving up and everything we started to um, experiment with cost a lot of money. Mm. So, yeah, there were times that we wanted to go to movie theater and we had ticket money for one person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or we couldn't go to cafeteria because we already been twice to cafeteria this month. And, you know, we just couldn't do that. And I remember my husband doing the sweetest gift ever. Like we had an anniversary and we didn't really have any opportunity to go out. And he just invited me to the car. And we had this most romantic dinner in the car. And he just, you know, made this himself. So that was our made up restaurant at this time. So, my point is that don't take any setbacks as a setback. Just try to be creative with that. And you, it's going to be so fun to mm. memorize those moments later um, because I guarantee that the regular thing, like going to a good restaurant, you're not going to remember that when you're 90 years old, but you're going to remember when you were completely broke and you made yourself feel like you went to a fancy restaurant and you actually just spent five bucks. Yeah. I'm going to read out some of these here. Uh, Egla is uh, the hardest working woman, great, fearless, go orientated, noble, very humble. My inspiration, that's from Maria. Chip, <laughs> Tiff says, uh, <laughs> chocolate pizza, tell us more, lol. Facebook user, I can really uh, completely relate. My husband about killed me a few times to a landed firmly in e-commerce, then said amen. Tiff says again, Need to hear this from Egla. Thank you. Friends and family do not support this type of behavior, but I see now you have to do what's right for you. And Christy is, uh, Egla is unstoppable for sure. Don't try this. You have been warned. Um, <laughs> Jamie says, awesome show, guys. Right. Darkest hour just before dawn. Oh, yeah. Tell Tell me. Yeah. Yeah. So my start of Amazon business was really, really like actually the hardest time of my life because I was pregnant for the third child. And for me, being pregnant is almost like, I don't know, that there is no crazier thing because I cannot eat anything. I vomit everything that I even like inhale. Mm. Uh, so you end up vomiting this yellow thing that you have in your stomach. I don't know how it's called in English. Bio. but. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So you're basically doing that every day. But I didn't have time. I had to collect money. I had to finance all the Amazon things. Yes, my husband was working, but he was basically paying the mortgage and you know, food bills. So I had yeah. to bring in money. And I was feeling so sick, so bad, so tired. And like I forced every second of this half a year, I forced myself to work with my digital marketing clients. And when I had to show up for their meetings, you know, I had to kind of put a lot of makeup on, like pump myself up because the reality was that I was vomiting so much that I couldn't drink anything. Um, uh, four days out of seven days, I was in a hospital. So they put this little tube into your arm. So they kind of thin your blood because the, the blood was so thick from not being able to keep any liquid in that they had to use the baby uh, versions of the needles and stuff. And that took forever to get the liquids in. And I felt so bad. I, I almost felt like, and you know, I couldn't go to sick leave either because I didn't pay myself salary mm. uh, because paying salary, you know, 50% goes to taxes. And I thought that I rather send this money to China. So if I think back about it, it's crazy. I would not recommend this to any Anybody. I'm happy my kid is okay. I don't know what I was going through in my mind. I wouldn't do that again, but um, I knew I had to test four products. So obviously I needed money. Uh, so I did baby bandana beads because of young mom. And another tip I would give that don't go to a baby category when you're <laughs> a beginner because there's just so many women out there, you know, yeah. the women who are just newly housewived and having babies. So they're just throwing so much money in there and you just don't want to go crazy in this niche. Yeah. So I had the bandana bibs and they completely failed. Uh, I even had some of like 3000 sets shipped to Estonia. I sold them to the local store. I didn't make any money out of them. A uh, second product was a baby uh, fitted crib sheets that kind of didn't go anywhere. Uh, I had a wrong material. 
I had to go for a cheaper one because the front page was uh, populated with the cheaper material. Mine was more expensive and it was in the second place. I never got the traction. I never got the velocity up that I needed to get the sales, the organic sales. And then we tried the balance beams um, for the young uh, girls who are taking gymnastic classes. And it was a foldable, portable balance beam for home practices. And that actually was the first time that I did systematic, fun um, uh, page development, like a listing development. I um, It was so fun to actually uh, figure out who is the buyer persona. It came out, if I went through the reviews of the competitors, that um, mo mostly the buyer of this product was a grandmother or a mother. And they, the main reason why they bought it is that they wanted to feel proud that their granddaughter or daughter did really well in the gymnastics class. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of like big people living out their dreams um, uh, with the small people. Yeah. So, of course, you take the logic from there that you uh, in the picture, in the lifestyle picture, you have to have a happy mom, a happy grandmother, uh, and then a very successful kid doing very crazy tricks in this uh, foldable balance beam. And um, I think this was, for me, it was so exciting because I get to use some neuropsychology uh, uh, that I'm really, really fascinated about because in Amazon, you know, we only have three seconds. So that was the first time I actually did that kind of like scientifically. And I, I love that a lot but this product did not work. One takeaway for us was that it was oversized and oversized products did not uh, go to California. They went to the other side <laughs> of the America and that just add all the profits. No matter what they tried to do, the shipping plan always showed something uh, far, far, far away from yeah. uh, Ontario 8. So it just, yeah. it just boomed, yeah. So around this time, what year was this? Uh, well, that was still in 2017, uh, maybe early 2018. Uh, but at the same time, you know, while testing out all those products, I also tested out, I, right now I'm in an in a office category. I did my first office category product and that started to sell almost okay. We were kind of dreaming that, yeah, we're selling three pieces a day. Oh my God, that's so much. Imagine if that sells 10 pieces a day. And then we figured out, oh my God, that's selling like 20 pieces a day. <laughs> mm. So we were like, yeah, we know how to do Amazon. And that's like classical story what follows from here. You just go cocky. You just yeah. go crazy. We packed our bags. We give our three kids to grandmother for three weeks. We went to Indonesia. We, we jumped on this little motorcycle. We started to drive through all those factories over there. So cute family ones, you know, you want to give them business because it's kind of like giving back. It's a romantic thing to do. And we filled up the container with all sorts of handmade and clothing uh, items. And uh, just a small little error in the customs uh, document ended up uh, destroying the whole patch that we collected into this uh, container. It was worth more than 25,000. So it all went to loss. Um, another takeaway from that was that, yeah, that was a customs error because, you know, Indonesians, they don't really do Amazon. So you have to invent and you have to teach everybody mm. along the way. If you do business with Chinese, they know everything. But yeah. Indonesia, everywhere else, you're in the not the steady ground. A second error we made is that we repurchased. Oh, there's some more, is there? I was going to say, they're going to give you a fucking break. Yeah, go on. <laughs> We repurchased some of those products and we yep. still brought them to Amazon, but there was 20 of them. Yep. You cannot physically do 20 listings. This is insane. Keyword research times 20, listing writing times 20, making pictures times 20. Hmm. When this work was done, the honeymoon was gone for three months already. So we were so done. We were, there's no hope for those products. So basically, we didn't, this is just a big minus. So yeah, we basically ended up selling our apartment just to come out from this mess. And we're wow. still paying that apartment back. Uh, <laughs> because you that sell, was, you that was a lesson of being, to, yeah, yes. to cover the cost. Yes. Yeah, we okay. sold the apartment. <laughs> so what are you now I, in? You were now in rented accommodation? Or was that one of the property portfolio or something like that we buy by this time we moved to the house already we had the apartment but we had to sell it so yeah yeah that goes the you know the pension fund comes goes from there 
Uh, okay. But you have to do you, you, that. What you have to do to survive. So, uh, 2018 was the second year in business in Amazon. We lost multiple five figures uh, in 2018. Launched a successful, um, started a successful office brand that we're still running today. Mm -hmm. But we, uh, the fiscal year, ended up in minus 14,000 euros, which is which is more in dollars if you want to do the math. So mm -hmm. that was a bad experience, but also a good one because you should never go crazy just be mm. humble be doing one product at a time and um yeah uh, but i know going crazy is a classical story when you have your first success i think athena said that she did like the, the yoga leggings or something and went crazy as well so yeah yeah please if is you're it, a it, beginner it, 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 listen, it, just don't do it. it's it's so like it's so easily done i think what people don't realize if you've never failed before you've got that cockiness right because you yes. don't experience enough that i'm saying this on mindset sunday the other day is that i had and i had this conversation i think it was with athena earlier on in the week it's like i've been thinking about this a lot recently is that you learn your biggest lessons through pain and often when something's painful you never repeat that you know like you can as an entrepreneur you can make mistakes every day and you can recover from those mistakes as long as they're not fatal and they're not final in terms of your business. But the best way of learning, and you'll never repeat them unless you're stupid, you never, ever repeat them again, is if you learn from pain. And you've had to go through a lot of stuff now. So you're multi-seven figures. You're getting ready for an exit. Tell us yeah. the actual remaining short window where it didn't <laughs> fuck up. Because you obviously it's taken off now. So tell us the good stuff, yeah? Oh, yeah. So the last 10 minutes of non-fuck up story. Yeah. Well, yeah, uh, I think what we've done differently as maybe some other sellers, you know, there is a lot of information out there that you have to test a lot of products and have to mm. launch every quarter a new product and stuff, which is true. I think this is true. But what I what our approach was actually, if you have a success and, you know, right now this one product is selling 100 to 200 units a day, which is really good. Um, we just took this one product. We started to redesign it. We made different sets. We started to put some bundle items on it. We uh, changed the color. Mm. Uh, we did original like uh, settings, for, uh, setups for these products. And we took this product and we brought it to Europe, to Canada. Now we're going to Australia, which is hugely successful. I had no idea. Kind of, um, Australia is so active market because everybody says eBay is a thing mm. over there. Yeah. Um, so what I recommend actually is that test different categories and different products until you find your golden mine and then when you mm. find your golden mine just build everything the portfolio at the top of this golden mine don't go crazy like selling all these different things because mm. you need to be an expert of your product niche mm. and i wouldn't we really want to be an expert of five different product niches because trust me i've been doing trash can trash um the trash bags mm. and even the trash bags are so complicated product that you're gonna go crazy with the thickness and the measurements and the tallness and you know, uh, you are just going to drive yourself down to the grave. Uh, mm. So find your one and do everything from there. Just copy paste it all over the world. And that's what we did. Uh, right now, our uh, revenue is about 300000 very soon at $300,000 a month. And about 50% of that comes from Europe. Definitely mm. go to Europe. Uh, so then, you know, Canada and all the other places. Uh, so um, you don't need to reinvent something that's already successful. Just take maximum out of it. And another tactic that is very, very beneficial to use is that you want to dominate first page. But you don't want to dominate first page from your one brand. Mm. Uh, because people want to choose. So it's good to have two or three different brands that don't look, look similar at all. Yeah. Uh, so they basically look like, yeah, there's just another seller, seller doing the same thing. Actually, just your product. So you've got you multiple know? brands selling the same products but different to each other you're just being one of the other comp i'm competing competitors. with myself yeah. yes and i'm also yeah. advertising under my own listings and that works terribly well my yeah. best ppc positions are the sponsored um, brands up there where you have just the uh, ad space yeah. and then the ace in targeting so those are bringing six times more money than the mm. sponsored products and so are you going to exit all of those brands? Because as you said, you're getting ready to sell, aren't you? So we won't talk about privacy there because of due diligence and other people looking at your business. But the goal is next is to take some legacy money off the table. Uh, yeah, well, and of course, I think to get some of the anxiety, some of the depths that uh, we developed along the way, uh, mm. just get those off the table. And we definitely want to do this again. We want to, I, we kind of figure that if once you learn the business, you can just, 
rotate the wheel after every three to four years and yeah. do the exit and go to more like complicated to go to more expensive niche so you don't compare yourself with the beginners and mm. that just draw 20,000 to Amazon just because you know some guru told them to do that yeah. so you kind of going to the blue ocean instead of the red ocean and that is a really good book I recommend everybody to read yeah so are you plan for legacy or money uh, well, legacy, because women in business is definitely my hard thing. You know, uh, in uh, the funny thing in Amazon is that the numbers get really big, really fast when they start to do that. And first it freaks you out. Then you have to kind of do mental thing that, yeah, it is okay to earn like 40,000 revenue. Oh, it is okay to go to next month is going to be 80,000. And then you're going to figure out, yeah, how the hell I'm going to finance that because I have to buy all this stock. Yeah. But the numbers get big really fast. And I don't really think those numbers are big for me what I draw like if I'm talking like somebody's believing in God I have my own source I'm just talking to my source and telling my source source please use me as a tool to put me out there for other women who are stuck um, yeah. in their everyday lives you know just use me <laughs> to tell them that so much more is possible yes it is not given to you in a silver plate but yeah so much more fun so much more personal development and also financial freedom to your families out there if you're willing to think outside the box and if any problem you face is actually an opportunity how would you like to be remembered <laughs> well if i can help other women create seven figure businesses if i at least can help one woman to do that you know i'm a humble one in that sense and if my friends and family love me who i am and i'm so grateful by now they have accepted me as i am and uh, this is the biggest gift actually i don't feel wrong anymore i've been feeling wrong so long time in my life <laughs> that's your in depth well yep. done that is uh... a you. A story, incredible story of persistence and <laughs> a lot to deal with. So congratulations. I think you're going to inspire a lot of people out there, men and women. So well done. Yeah. Very proud of you and, and good to call you a friend. Yes, I'm very proud to call you a friend too. And you know, people, uh, anybody who's listening, just come to Amazon conferences. You're going to meet me there. You're going to meet Danny there. And that's like, a, I think that's one of the my favorite crowds out there is the Amazon people because we're crying, uh, we are crazy, but we are so friendly, so fun, so outgoing, so supportive of each other. I just love this community that we've been built up in the last four years. Excellent. Right, we're going to finish there. Um, what's the best way that people can reach you? Yeah, come find me from Instagram, for example, or from Facebook. So I'm pretty active in Instagram. So I'm kind of documenting my female entrepreneurship story in Instagram. So find me in Instagram, Eklerotic, as uh, super easy. And I'd love to connect over there and share some philosophies of how to survive as entrepreneur. Excellent. Right, guys, I'll be back here on Mindset Sunday. Egla, thank you for joining us again, guys. Thank you for joining. I didn't get to read out all of your messages. We've got one minute or so there. Let me just quickly see. Side B says, great story of persistence and resilience. Thanks for sharing. Tiff says, very inspiring story. Hussein says, thank you. Matt says, and breathe. Uh, <laughs> Egla is a star. True motivation for people around her. Glad to see her succeed. Truly deserves it. Anne Ferris says, amazing. Alex Wyatt says, amazing to hear and everything that you have done. And I think we've covered most of those there. So quite good feedback there as well. Right, we're going to shoot. I'll be back here at 4 p.m. on Sunday, BST. Take care, look after your family, and I'll see you all soon. Bye-bye, everybody.